Coordinated Assistance to States, better known as CCAS webinar on reducing isolation in youth facilities, strategies for working with your most challenging youth. My name is Sharon Pett and I am the project manager for the Reducing Isolation in Youth Facilities Technical and Training Assistance Program. I've been providing training and technical assistance to a total of 14 jurisdictions throughout the United States on their efforts to implement alternatives to isolation. So Ned Logren, who is the Executive Director of the Council of Juvenile Correctional Administrators, or CJCA, is unable to be here today, but I wanted to thank him and CJCA for making this webinar possible and available to all of you. And helping us produce this webinar is Brendan Donahue, who is the Technology Manager for the Performance-Based Standards Learning Institute. And without Brendan, this webinar certainly would not be uh, possible because he is the information technology mastermind behind the scenes, making sure that everything is functioning correctly. So thank you, Brendan. So it's important for everyone to know that the Reducing Isolation in Youth Facilities Initiative is made possible through a partnership with the Center for Coordinated Assistance to States. CCAS was developed in 2014 with a grant from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, or OJDDP as we know it. The purpose of the center is to assess the need for and coordinate the training and technical assistance designed to build the capacity within states, territories, tribal units and communities to maximize the effectiveness of juvenile justice systems to benefit the youth they serve. The focus of the center really is to provide ongoing coaching to achieve individual and or behavior changes that positively impact the juvenile justice system. So joining OJDDP as partners on this project is the American Institute of Research in Washington, D.C., as well as the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform at Georgetown University. So we thank you all for your contributions and your continued partnership. So I'd like to hand the floor over to Brendan so he can go over a few housekeeping rules um, before we launch into the content of the webinar. Brendan? Thanks, Sharon, and uh, thank you for all of you for attending. I see some names that have attended some of our past webinars, so welcome back to those of you. Uh, just a reminder here, you've got two different options to listen to the audio on today's call. You can either listen on your computer speakers or you can dial in through your phone. If you are dialing in on your phone and you uh, hear some feedback, I would recommend making sure that you've chosen the telephone option on your webinar control panel and that you've also entered the PIN number that they give you once you choose that option. Uh, so if you're calling in on the phone, we highly recommend that to reduce any unwanted noise. Uh, we do have a lot of people registered here, over 500 people that registered for this webinar. So because we've got such a large group, everyone will be muted for the duration of today's presentation. But you can type in your questions to our panelists anytime. So as soon as you think of a question that you want to ask, go ahead and type it here on this control panel. And what we'll do is we'll hold a session at the end of the webinar and try to address as many of those questions as we can. Uh, we are going to be recording this webinar as we do with all of CJCA's webinars. We uh, archive them on the CJCA YouTube page and we'll uh, provide you with a link to that recording as well as a copy of today's PowerPoint presentation. We usually send those within 48 hours of the webinar end. So if you're looking for a copy of the slides, don't worry, we'll either email them to you and uh, you should have them by the end of the week here. So with all that, let's go ahead and uh, Sharon, tell us what we'll be talking about today. Great. Thank you, Brendan. So I'd like to begin uh, first by introducing uh, the presenters for today's program. Um, we're very fortunate to actually have four panelists today who work within three different state juvenile justice agencies. And so today we have Peter Forbes, who is the commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Youth. Uh, we also have Natalie Walker, who serves as the assistant director of the Indiana Division of Youth Services. He, she is joined by uh, Mark Canola, who is the program director of the Indiana Division of Youth Services. And last but certainly not least, we are fortunate to have Kirsten Kolb, who is the project manager of the Youth Reformation System for the Oregon Youth Authority. I want to thank all of you for being here today and being willing to carve out time in your busy schedules to share your knowledge with all of us. We really appreciate it. So I'd like to review today's webinar object objectives. Uh, the first objective is to better understand strategies for working with youth who have chronic or significant mental health issues, primary or secondary trauma, and or have exhibited repeated assaultive or aggressive behavior. So secondly, we hope that participants will learn how three state juvenile justice agency, that's Indiana, Massachusetts, and Oregon, 
effectively programmed for these most challenging youth. And finally, we hope that participants will be able to take the information they learn from today's webinar and apply it to their daily interactions with youth in their facilities. So in the field of juvenile justice, we've all encountered a wide variety of youth who present with very unique issues and who could easily be identified or classified as challenging. So however, I'm, I'm sure that we can all agree that these three groups listed on the screen tend to be in the higher echelon in terms of youth who require additional staff time, attention, and support. And so therefore, the, the focus of today's webinar uh, will be on sharing strategies for dealing with those youth who are challenged by significant and or chronic mental health issues, those youth who have been affected by trauma, either second, uh, primary or secondary, and those youth who present highly aggressive or assaultive behavior. So that, that is the scope of our work here today. So let's get started by talking a little bit about uh, youth with mental health issues. So I'm certain in our uh, professional experience, it's no secret that there has been a drastic increase in the number of youth exhibiting serious mental health issues showing up in our juvenile justice facilities. Um, in terms of research, uh, the professional body of literature has verified this to be true. So in one meta-analysis published by the uh, Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, they found en that anywhere from 63 to 92% of youth met the formal criteria for mental health or substance use disorder. To me, in my professional opinion, uh, this percentage is astounding. Um, they also found that the issue of mental health disorders is exacerbated by the fact that most young people suffer not just from one disorder, but from two or more serious mental health disorders. So this obviously makes our work with these young people uh, even more challenging, even more complex, sort of an, an enigma or a puzzle that we need to figure out in order to best serve these youth, if indeed our ultimate goal is to help youth become positive members of society. So this is a list um, of the most common mental health diagnoses that we're seeing in juvenile justice facilities. Um, these likely come as no surprise to you folks. Um, we see you know, lots of ADHD, PTSD, conduct disorder, major depression, and so on. So as a reminder, again, youth are not only battling one of these disorders, um, but in fact often more than two simultaneously. So the second subpopulation we will be talking about today are youth who have experienced simple or complex trauma in their lives. So the research is clear that trauma is a pervasive issue in our juvenile justice facilities. In the study mentioned here, uh, researchers found that 93% of youth in custody had at least one traumatic incident, and over half of the youth population had experienced trauma six or more times. Um, this level of trauma is, quite frankly, unprecedented and, in fact, quite alarming. Uh, with this knowledge, it, it may be easier for us to understand some of the negative behaviors that we witness or experience in our facilities on a day-to-day -day basis. So what the research also tells us is that in addition to trauma impacting a youth's ability to regulate their emotions, it also puts them at greater risk for developing depression, PTSD, and suicidal ideation. And these youth are also at increased risk for engaging in delinquent behavior, running away, struggling academically, and abusing alcohol and drugs. So the third pro uh, population that we're going to be focusing on today are those youth who present with highly aggressive and or highly assaultive behaviors. So this excerpt you see on your screen here was selected from the Desktop Guide to Quality Practice for Working with Youth in Confinement, uh, which was published by OJJDBH and some of their partners. So this selection really does call upon us as professionals to recognize the skill deficits in um, these youth and cater our treatment to addressing these deficiencies rather than adhering to the traditional approach of punishment. So we're going to be hearing from our presenters some of the effective strategies that they use to address youth deficits with the goal of preventing um, or decreasing aggressive and assaultive youth behaviors. So and so when we're working with this particular subgroup, those that are highly aggressive and assaultive, um, the question to ask ourselves is not what do we do with a youth who is seriously aggressive, but rather what have we done or not done before that um, has allowed this youth's behavior to escalate to this point. And so once again, it is our responsibility as professionals to employ st effective strategies to dealing with this, these challenging youth populations. So I wanted to share this last um, excerpt with you because I think it's a good reminder that by the very nature of the youth in our juvenile justice systems, uh, there's a lot of work to be done with all three of these subpopulations we're discussing today, our most challenging youth. So this excerpt reminds us that behavior management is not a one-time response, 
but rather in order to really effectively um, affect positive behavior change, we must build a culture that views these youth through a therapeutic lens. So it's our responsibility to address the deficits of these young people by building their skills, assisting them in identifying their triggers, teaching them tools to regulate their emotions, and of course, teaching them how to identify and transform their thinking errors. So, it, it, so in essence, the fundamental question for today's webinar is how can we best serve these specialized youth populations and avoid using isolation while also ensuring that staff continue to feel supported in their daily work with youth. So I'm going to hand the floor over now to our first two panelists from the Indiana Division of Youth Services, Natalie Walker and Mark Canola. Natalie and Mark, the floor is yours. OK, thank you. This is Mark. I'll be starting. Uh, next slide, please. In Indiana, we've implemented a series of initiatives to work with chronically mentally ill, trauma-affected youth, and highly aggressive youth. And these include such things as staff training, multidisciplinary disciplinary meetings, individualized behavior plans, and housing units and incentive programs. Next slide. So with regard to um, our staff training, after completing a pre-service academy, our juvenile staff have an additional one week of training to focus on juvenile specific topics. And we've outlined a few of those here that uh, pertain to that. So it's called the MAC Academy. It's a Making a Change Academy is what that one week is called. And it's listed on the slide are a few topics we cover during the MAC Academy. The training is lecture style with a classroom discussion and activities. We discuss adolescent development and break them into each stage, including physical, cognitive, emotional, and social changes. Prior to the MAC Academy, staff are provided with information about mental health issues, such as disorders, descriptions of typical behavior, et cetera. During effective interactions, that one class, to build their knowledge on, um, of mental health needs, we provide information about how to apply that information into the work setting. It is, a, it is great to have the background knowledge, but people need to know how to communicate and interact with youth with mental health needs. The staff are provided with techniques that assist in the communication with all students, but especially the students with mental health needs. In this training module, the focus is empathetic listening and de-escalation techniques. Staff are coached on the do's and don'ts of being aware of their tone, for example, making one request at a time, acknowledging the other person's feelings, and making sure they do not sound patronizing or sarcastic. During supervising high-risk students, the interactions while supervising high-risk students opens to the topic of an attitude of control or a controlling attitude. The latter, a controlling attitude, is about punishment and others feeling bullied. We all know that that does not work well with our youth population, especially those with mental health issues. The attitude of control is about the youth feeling the staff are in control of the environment through consistency and fairness of rule enforcement. There is discipline, but discipline is different than punishment. With discipline, there is communication regarding the incident or behavior. The goal is to help the youth understand why the behavior is unacceptable, impose a logical consequence, and teach the youth new acceptable behavior. Within trauma-informed care, participants learn the different types of trauma, impacts of trauma such as emotional, psychological, physiological, and social. They learn to recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma, and ways to respond without re-traumatizing. Staff are advised that they are not treating the trauma, yet they are treating the individual as special needs due to trauma history in a sensitive, caring, and welcoming manner. The module regarding your responsibility making a change discusses the student's expectations of staff and also expectations the department has of the staff, which are similar to the youth expectations. The expectations are for staff to be in control, professional, and care. We talk about being aware of the students, their behavior, any changes, positive and negative, and addressing or reporting the behavior. The different ways of youth accountability are shared with the staff. For example, the code of conduct or utilizing the token economy. Another topic in this module is staff's responsibility regarding mentoring and coaching, which is assisting the youth to make better choices and guide them towards more successful reentry back into the community. The care team, which we've talked about during previous webinars, is ascribed to the new employees during this process. The care team is another way to display professionalism and role model conflict resolution skills to the youth. 
The final scenario, scenario situation we talk about is coaching. This is a scenario-based class. It's the last class during the MAC Academy week. The new staff are given scenarios to role play. The situations vary from non-compliant behavior, self-mutilation, discipline, de-escalation, for example. An example of the scenario is a youth does not comply with the request to line up for a school movement. There's a, a two-person role play. One staff is role playing the role of the staff. The other person is role playing as a student in the scenario. The staff act out how they would approach the situation if it occurred in real life. They receive feedback on their role play and receive constructive criticism from others in the class. They're challenged to think about the skills they've learned over the course of that week and how that could have helped them during the situation. For example, uh, motivational interviewing and calming the storm. The annual refresher is given to staff as the veteran staff. So once they've had a year of experience, then they go through the refresher. Not all of these topics are given again, but the highlights from these topics are given during the annual refresher. Next slide. The multidisciplinary meetings, um, as we've discussed in previous webinars, in Indiana, we've tried to foster a team uh, effort concept. And that involves constant communication between custody, treatment, and mental health staff especially during daily incident monitoring meetings, which I know we've talked about before. But with the increased number of youth who have challenges, we also have implemented weekly multidisciplinary team meetings. And this is when staff from all departments get together, review the week, and process as a group what has been going on with certain students, groups of students, or patterns in the facility as a whole. And we also invite families uh, to attend when able or uh, communicate via phone when, when necessary where we find it would be helpful. Um, these meetings are very solution focused. Uh, they help the departments monitor what each department has been trying to do with students. Um, for the kids who are struggling, what have we been working on? What has been working for them? What do people have different ideas? And then we assess if these solutions should continue, need readjusting, or can be discontinued. And so this way, we're not just talking about uh, mental health staff or treatment staff coming up with a solution for a student's behavior. It's having everybody at the table so that we can figure out you know, if a student's acting up in a certain area, for example, in recreation or when they're on the units um, with the line custody staff, how can we help them as well? So that you know, what might work in a classroom or in a treatment program may not work on the unit. So these multidisciplinary uh, team meetings help bring everyone together to brainstorm. These meetings also allow mental health staff to review all students on medication to see if there have been positive or negative changes in the youth as observed by facility staff and also by the families. At the same time, all the departments can discuss difficult cases with the mental health staff present to get their input on either individual ways to address these students' behavior issues, um, ways to help the student choose positive alternatives, or even allow the mental health staff to triage which youth should uh, be put into more mental health services, or if programs need to be intensified, do they need to provide more time with the youth, either one-on-one -on -one with mental health, or if we can do it through the mental health programs that we provide. Um, because these difficult cases, as we call them, um, usually tend to be students already being seen by mental health. Um, and the students are receiving skills in our mental health groups, such as DBT, Dialectical Behavior Therapy, or MRT, Moral Recognition Therapy. But our staff members aren't necessarily uh, attending those programs. And so the mental health staff do spend some time weekly teaching us the skills that the students are learning. Um, for example, the mental health provider may relate that a student this week is going to be trying to use a DBT skill like moment to pause. The whole team can then brainstorm on how, how, what's the best ways we can help that student pause. So for example, at our Camp Summit Boot Camp, you know, there's a lot of marching and maybe, there, maybe that's not always appropriate for a student to take moment to pause, but how can we work with the drill instructors to allow that student that time to do it since that's what his solution for his behaviors is this week. So it, it allows some, some uh, training across departments and skills. And so that way the students uh, know that, that staff already know what they're working on and can help them. For each student, uh, we want to do, uh, share some knowledge uh, about these students. And so we do that on a student information sheet. It's initially created by treatment staff after we receive a student at a facility. But it's primarily used by our custody staff. 
and it gives them uh, some advice on what behaviors they might expect out of a youth. We don't provide an entire history of the youth's behaviors and what they might be coming from, but just more of what, what can you expect or some suggestions for what does work with the student and definitely what does not work with the student. So for example, a student who may have some really real issues with people being in their personal space. We might note on that, even, even things like that, and, and definitely other uh, mental health issues that they're having or behavior problems. Uh, the sheet also contains some information on the youth committing offense. Uh, we update their treatment level and their treatment progress, what groups they're in, what skills they might be using, their current meds. Uh, we add their individual educational needs. So if the sheet is being used by custody staff helping monitor education, they'll know what they're supposed to do with students while they're in education. And also we talk about their projected release dates. And this just gives a little snapshot for custody staff uh, to be able to, to work with that student and have some information on them. After the weekly meeting, these sheets are con continually updated to include any changes in behavior concerns as well as new solutions for students' behaviors. And so again, without getting at the root cause of the behavior, we're not letting custody in on all of that. It's more practical. And so it's, you know, this has come up, a student had a, uh, some bad news from home, they're not dealing with it very well because typically they haven't dealt with uh, stress or pressure. This is what we've come up with for them to do. Please help them do this on the unit. And here's, here's what you might be seeing from them. They're not going to be um, upset and wanting to talk about it. Might just, they might just lash out at you instead. So trying to predict um, with the student's help and the family's help what the students normally do when they're under pressure like that. Um, We've also encouraged facilities to use this meeting as our chance to refer students to and review students in mental health programs. So that way mental health staff can be, without you know, getting too much into it, can reveal um, what students are learning in these programs and how can we help tie it to their individualized case plans and to their individual lives in the facility. Um, and this way we can also, by knowing what's working with them in group, start predicting what could help them work uh, when they go home. So, you know, one thing, I know we're focused a lot on working with challenging students in our facilities, but these students will also be challenges when they go home and have these special needs. And so we also want to be, if we discover what's working for them with us, we want to make sure that we repeat that for them and, and have a support system ready for them when they go home. Finally, this meeting allows staff just some time to reflect and identify patterns of concern and plan how to address possible issues before they rise to the level of the incident. So a couple of webinars ago, we talked about uh, daily incident monitoring, which I think you know, it's very important for us to do that. But we also want to be a little more proactive. And so by having all of the department staff represented weekly, we can start talking about what's going on in the facility. Is there something small that we've noticed or some changes? Um, yet, you know, and then another staff person can say, yes, I've seen that too while they're in class, or this has been going on with they're on the unit. We can start predicting what might be happening and problem solving as a group before an incident happens. Um, we can even start talking about with custody staff members there, we can talk about how they're doing better or worse during certain shifts. And, you know, we also use this time when we're doing this proactive problem solving. Um, it allows cu uh, the custody representative come in and, and talk about um, what their line staff are doing. And we can recognize what line staff are doing to come up with things to help students. They're the ones who are working with them the most. And so their successes can help out. Next slide. Okay, behavior plans. Um, the student information sheet that I was talking about is really just one type of behavior plan that we use on the housing units. Um, with all of our behavior plans, we get input from the youth and from the staff of all departments. We also contact the youth's family to get their input on how we can help their child or what's worked in the past or what definitely doesn't work. Um, family members may also be involved in sessions with treatment staff to work out issues that the youth has at home and way that we can utilize their pro-social skills at home. Uh, behavior plans may include detailed information on the youth's general history if needed. However, these also include individualized information on the student's specific behavior issues with suggestions for interactions and recommended interventions. Again, this way everyone's uh, aware of the student's needs and has worked with them and the family on specific solutions. Uh, behavior issues are broken down into specific and measurable focused behaviors, so we want to give the student clear uh, targets and clear uh, uh, goals, 
And so such as earning certain percentages of points or not receiving certain amounts of behavior reports. But we try to be as solution focused as possible. So the behavior plan should indicate what skills they should be using in more of a strengths-based way. So positive things that we'd like to see the student trying to do. And then these plans can also outline behavioral reinforcements for when the students do utilize these skills. These plans, uh, next slide. Or sorry, go back. Okay, yeah, okay the slide advanced. Um, these plans can also have consequences as well as can list skills that staff are allowed to utilize to help the students, such as allowing them to journal, using the stress ball, and using a specific skill. And these, design, these plans can all be designed as a contract. Um, everyone can sign off of them, including all staff, so it's shared with everybody. And for us, the type of behavior plans that we have include, you know, we do this for our education departments with, in, with input from their IEPs. We do this for care team comes up with a plan. We do it on the units, but we also do it with our temporary separation. So if we separate a student, they have to come up with a behavior plan for how they're going to fix their problems that led them into separation. Next step. Next uh, slide. So in the we talk about the MAC program, and the MAC program is a structured and safe therapeutic environment that assists youth in developing appropriate social skills while continuing to participate in education treatment programs within a controlled set. So we've talked about that and um, addressed it a few times in the past of what that program is about. But some of the groups they do in that program are the Aggression Replacement Therapy, which is ART. It provides the youth with the skills to learn self-control when they are becoming angry. So the youth learns to identify their triggers, cues, reducers, reminders, and self-evaluation. The goal of this group is to have the youth identify pro-social behaviors to replace past aggressive reactions. Mark alluded earlier to Dialectic Behavior Therapy, DBT, which is designed to help students deal with frustration, tolerance, stress relief, and impulsivity. This therapy is also is additional for students who frequently need support with dealing with their mental health issues. MRT, Moral Recognition Therapy, is a proven evidence-based and systematic treatment strategy that seeks to decrease recidivism among juveniles by increasing moral reasoning. MRT targets youth who are at high risk to reoffend and high risk in criminal thinking. Also, Mark alluded to while in these programs, the youth are getting in contact with the mental health staff. They're on the units consistently checking in, noticing their different behaviors, everything like that. Next slide. So another part that we talked about was specialized or intensive programs that we have at, our, at all our facilities or at a facility in particular. So one of the programs we have at one facility is SHAPE. It's Specialized Housing, Achieving Developmental and Educational Success. This program was developed to meet therapeutic needs of identified youth. SHAPE is a specialized treatment for, program for youth with mental health and emotional disorders. It is not a mental health unit. I need to stress that. The goal of the program is to maintain students in the least restrictive environment, because as we know, most of these kids typically end up in a segregation unit. So this keeps them out in general population while involving them in treatment programming and using non-punitive incentive-based approaches for managing the behavior and making a tr productive transition into the community. The staff that work in the SHADES unit have a manual that outlines topics such as staff responsibilities, um, treatment programming so they know what the youth are doing while they're in, in the unit, interventions for staff to utilize with the youth. Interventions include informal awareness, which is the discussion of the behavior, token economy, uh, behavior awards and timelines that are individualized. There's a 411 or an information binder for the staff which provides snapshots of the youth, which is very similar to what Mark was referring to with the student sheets. The issues, the behavior to be aware of, interventions to utilize, and behavior plans if they are applicable. There is a signed CD in the unit typically. Um, there's reflection and art stations and activity boxes. So the youth have things to do on the unit. We also have an honor or incentive programs at each facility. Each facility has a program that recognizes and rewards students that go above and beyond the general performance expectations. You either assess on their behavior, such as hygiene, compliance with rules or redirection, um, number of conduct reports, etc. Treatment involvement and education performance. They must demonstrate a good faith effort. Typically, the program involves a different colored shirt, so the staff and other students recognize the youth that are on the honor status. And the youth receive extra privileges or incentives, such as commissary, off-ground trips, um, one of our female facilities has makeup for their, their youth, so that is one of the incentives. Another program we have at one facility is the, the Y-Tri unit. The Y-Tri is a converted segregation unit. 
We no longer utilize segregation at that facility. They made it an honor dorm. Students earn their way to the unit by meeting behavior and performance expectations. The unit is less structured by the facility staff. It's more structured by the students and they take responsibility for the basic operations and needs of the unit. The students have alarm clocks, so they're responsible for waking themselves up in the morning. They even establish the weekly cleaning schedule. Students develop the unit expectations and schedule, for example, how long the youth can play the video game system. The units also prepare the youth for transition into adulthood. So that covers what we do in Indiana. So Kristen, you now can take over. Thank you, Natalie. Next slide, please. So good afternoon. I'm honored to share with you some of the very uh, recent and exciting work Oregon is doing around populations of complex trauma youth and aggressive and assaultive youth. We want to ensure that these youth are also receiving the care and services needed for ideal and optimal outcomes. In 2005, our organization formally began training to our staff on positive human development. Our model is foundational in safety and security meaning not only physical safety and security, but also emotional and psychological safety and security. Once this is established, we believe youth, staff, and organizational partners, such as families, volunteers, and stakeholders, can engage in caring and supportive relationships, high expectations and accountability, meaningful participation, and community connection. Our culture of PhD is grounded in the belief that PhD is not what we do, but it is how we do it. Our culture of PhD develops and fosters healthy environments and healthy engagement and relationships, which together supports healthy adolescent brain development. Next slide. PhD considers all people we come into contact with are viewed as resources. Understanding the way in which we view individuals is imperative to the way in which we interact and how the message is received both interpersonally and environmentally. Awareness of this lens in which individuals are being viewed impacts the interpretation of behaviors observed and experienced. If we take a resource lens, we believe that change occurs when people build skills and receive support. Viewing youth as resources in a PhD model requires the belief that people can be accountable and strengthened simultaneously. It is also the understanding that PhD is not something that we do to others, but it's a collaborative process and it's something that we do with them. We also believe that we must show up to every interaction, every time, with that resource lens. And that we also know environments impact body language and behaviors. And finally, the resource lens views others as a resource to be, others as resource to be developed and not problems to be fixed. Next slide. Around the same time that we were launching the positive human development culture with OIA, we were also experiencing an increase in incidents, and incidents involving physical harm, specifically on one unit at our largest campus. In response to these behaviors, the agency responded by asking how can we create a model program to support the youth, improve outcomes, decrease incidents, and support staff. We were asked and tasked to align this program with PhD and have it support skill development, attachment, and engagement. Next slide. In true PhD fashion, we developed a participatory and collaborative process. So we took this unit and we invited all staff and treatment providers and those that were assigned to this team to come together and start reviewing cases from that unit of all the cases that were there within the previous quarter. What we realized at this time is that we were serving two very distinct populations. We were serving youth who struggle to develop and maintain relationships, who also become assaultive and aggressive, and these youth had a history of complex trauma. We also were serving youth in the same unit that we in Oregon call willfully aggressive. And these are youth that perhaps are more intentionally assaultive and aggressive, but otherwise have the skills necessary to build and maintain relationships. Next slide. The scope of this project ended up expanding not only to create a new program, but also a new protocol. We needed to establish a program that was developmentally intensive and an environment that supports brain development, and a safety protocol to address youth who are assaultive and may need to be removed from traditional living environments on a temporary basis, 
with the goal of reintegrating them back into their originating unit or community, or in some cases, and hopefully not many, um, but they may kind of as a last resort end up in a different community. Next slide. So some of the things that we learned is that in the development of the new program is that complex trauma impacts core developmental processes. We know that some of those traditional responses to those problem behaviors such as isolation or functioning or removal from their home community can exacerbate that underlying trauma and can increase and increase problem behavior. So we needed a program that was intensely focused on self-regulation and skill development. We call this the brain gym concept, and it's really creating an environment and curriculum that provides youth opportunities to learn skills, make healthy decisions, and it's really kind of working out the brain or the frontal lobe of the brain. Next slide. The next step in this process was really to begin looking at a new curriculum. The name of the curriculum is Nexus. And within each of these um, modules of Excel, Balance, Contribute, and Believe, we have sessions that help teach skills and um, primarily around emotional regulation, things such as mindfulness, understanding how your brain works, understanding how to actually work your brain, tools and skills around resilience, and also how to achieve lifestyle, lifestyle balance. Next slide. The model for Nexus was developed by several mental health specialists and clinicians within OIA. It is based upon the CBT platform and is informed by many other various curricula. It is teaching youth age-appropriate skills in areas of, as I mentioned, emotional regulation, lifestyle balance, positive self-concept, and connecting to a community, and goal visioning and achievement. Next slide. So now that we have the program with the curriculum, it was really time to bring those staff back together and take them out on a two-week retreat. And the purpose of this is really for staff buy-in to their program. These staff had experienced um, trauma of their own based upon the populations that they were serving, and by mixing those populations, as I mentioned, being involved in very severe and significant incidents. So one of the things that we know about youth is that when we include them and involve, involve them in their plan, they're more bought in. Well, we know the same thing about staff. And again, in honoring that PhD approach, we knew that we couldn't step aside and create this program for staff and then expect them to excel at it. So rather, we did a two-week retreat, and what you see on this slide is actually the um, logo that they themselves developed and created to represent their unit. They named their unit the University of Life, and we also spent time developing what we call a why statement. So how is your unit different and unique and set apart from everybody else? And when you all show up to work every day, what's it really mean to you to be a part of this team? And their why statement was, we believe in all youth, we engage, commit, invest, and excel together. Next slide. As part of this staff retreat, we spent quite a bit of time in this two weeks knowing our youth and the strategies that we would use, um, the best practices for these youth. So these would be things like understanding trauma, being trauma-informed, how to create a, a PhD culture, uh, time spent understanding the developing brain, trauma and the, the impact of isolation on trauma. And then we also spent quite a bit of time for these staff to really develop and create their program. They, as I mentioned, spent time developing their wide statement. They established a new and innovative grading system. They spent time talking about rewards and sanctions specific to these youth, rules and expectations. And the rules, interestingly, are not very lengthy but they spent more time thinking about what are the non-negotiables, and outside of that, how can we be flexible in our programming. They also spent time on things like signs and graphics and environmental messaging. They focused on outcomes, 30, 60, and 90 day. They spent time doing some team building. As I mentioned, they named their program, and also spent time talking about the resources and support that they would need to ensure that they would be successful with their new program and working with a specific population. Next slide. The referral process to the University of Life, also called the U, 
can be a direct referral from our intake unit. So those youth would be identified at the early onset of um, commitment to a closed custody environment. The other way is that if they come from an existing living unit, it would be through a comprehensive multidisciplinary team review. There is a formal referral process, referral form, and then that referral is reviewed by the youth referral team. This has been accepted onto the U, then the U team does kind of a reach in approach and visits and introduces themselves um, to that youth as the existing unit that they're on. This helps start to build those relationships and give, some, give the youth a point of contact when they arrive on the U um, on their first day. Next slide. The admission criteria for the U requires that the youth have a formally assessed trauma history by a psychologist. If the youth does not have this completed assessment, then we must put that referral on hold until one is available. The trauma symptoms must be present and manifest in this form of emotional reactivity, which is consistent with complex developmental trauma. As you can see here, emotional reactivity is defined as the youth's, pres the youth's present inability to appropriate re-regulate their emotions, resulting in behavior that is disruptive to themselves, others, or the general milieu. Oftentimes, we, the behavior that we see for emotionally reactive youth may be as a result of experience from being bullied. They may dis display behavior outbursts and respond minimally to staff redirection. It may require significant time and resources for the, that youth to re-regulate. Youth may isolate as a means of coping, and they may exhibit moderate to severe behavior impulsivity. Emotional reactivity is verified by a combination of file review, incident report review, direct observation, and input from living unit staff. Next slide. As I mentioned, the U team discussed at length the importance of program support in order for their success with this population. Several things occurred. We built a resource committee that meets with the, the um, leadership of the unit two times per month. They talk about what's going well, new youth that are coming into the unit, youth that have completed the program and are um, um, transitioning, pardon me, transitioning to another unit or a community-based program. Um, and they also talk about any resources that they need or barriers that they need removed um, for success. We also provide ongoing training and education at their um, regular monthly staff meetings. We also in provide reach and support from our Office of Inclusion and Intercultural Relations. And we also have a transition JPPO or Juvenile Parole and Probation Officer that meets with these youth on a frequent and regular basis. We have a program develop development specialist that is um, available uh, weekly. And we also have training and clear expectations of support units or teams. That specific item became imperative because one of the important pieces of this programming was that if a youth was displaying um, aggressive or acting out behavior, that when we have a support team come in to help su support the team and this youth, we wanted the um, response to be much more um, collaborative and working with that youth in an attempt to avoid any type of removal from the, the unit or isolation placement. And so it may, have take, it may take a little bit different approach with this youth to try and keep them on, on unit. Next slide, please. So that pretty much wraps up the first um, scope of this project, which was, which was really around kind of the program development side. The other side of this was the new protocol. And as I mentioned, in Oregon, we call this group of youth willfully aggressive. And really what we were looking for, because historically, when we saw youth acting out um, aggressively, we oftentimes um, relocated them to a new community or a new unit. And one of the things that we wanted to eliminate was that movement, if at all possible. And so it really is creating no destination unit for this assaultive behavior. But that rather we create a protocol that intensively focuses on conflict resolution, conflict management, and to intolerance. The goal is to return to the living communi community whenever possible and as quickly as possible. 
the last resort is moving to another living community. Next slide. The community safety protocol is designed for youth who have demonstrated behaviors that clearly indicate that they are an imminent threat to themselves or others within the community. The types of behavior that suggest referral for placement on a community safety protocol are characterized by continuously violent and or, and or aggressive behavior that can create significant safety concerns for the milieu. Or significantly intensive situations can warrant being placed on a community safety protocol, and this may be things such as an assault that results in serious bodily harm, considerable property damage, and or significant community impact of the event. All assignments and treatment work when a youth is placed on a community safety protocol, protocol will be focused on reintegrating back into their living community. The activities will take place to support the community in becoming ready for a restorative process when the youth is ready to return. Next slide. The primary focus of the community safety protocol is on safety of the community, conflict resolution, conflict management and tolerance, problem solving strategies, and returning to the community promptly. Next slide. Some of the specific community safety protocol interventions include different things such as peer mediation, use of staff mediation, Plan B, collaborative problem solving, unit restrictions, and change commitments. We also have um, interventions such as a behavior analysis, uh, plan A debrief from, debrief from collaborative problem solving, re-regulation strategies, goal setting, thinking reports, and social skills. So that concludes um, Oregon's uh, work around these two um, different populations, and now I'm going to turn it over to Peter Forbes from Massachusetts. Thank you very much, Kirsten. Um, so in Massachusetts, why, in the process of really trying to navigate the change and the shift away from a reliance on room confinement, we've tried a number of different things that have, um, we've been successful at some level with a number of things that I wanted to share with you. One is we, in the same time frame, we really shifted toward a um, an incentive-based approach where we moved away from the traditional point and level system where kids wake up with 100 points, youth wake up with 100 points, and essentially some kids lose points all day long. We found that that was really um, toxic in that a certain percentage of you can't navigate that kind of system and they essentially fall out and wind up, you know, literally wind up on the bench or in the chair in the hall. Um, we've, we've, we've made a priority of engaging youth in interest, getting youth to buy in. We've leveraged incentives where youth can obtain tokens, you know, at the program level and we've done that in a, in a generic way at the program level, but we've also allowed for a lot of um, individual um, creativity around what an incentive would look like, what, what would be meaningful to a particular youth. We've embraced DBT. Really, in the, in the 10 years that we've been working on this, DBT um, has been a huge focus for us. And in Massachusetts, we run DBT pro, uh, programming two groups um, per week in every single program so that youth um, essentially build their skill portfolio throughout the duration of their commitment. We also do it on, on detention status. So you have youth to come in uh, for a couple of short detention stays, get oriented at the point of commitment. They're already beginning to work on DBT and we, and we carry that forward into the community. A huge piece for us on the DBT front or the cognitive behavioral strategy, whatever your cognitive behavioral strategy is, is we shifted from it being really in the clinical realm to getting our direct care workers involved, particularly our senior supervisors. So we have um, our, all of our DBT groups are co-facilitated by a clinician, a licensed clinician, and a senior direct care staff, whether that's a soup, 
or a direct a direct care worker. Um, and that was huge in getting DBT infused into the life space. So it's not just another group that they go to, but that it's actually integrated into the daily operations. Um, a fourth thing that we've done is in Indiana talked about multidisciplinary meetings. We, we're doing a faster and dirtier version of that where we have it, we implemented a policy <coughs> that allows for individual support plans. And that individual support plan is called for when we have a kid that's, act, a youth that's acting out, not responding to programming, having a lot of problems with the adjustment. And we've done it in a way that it's essentially the treatment team at the program with the youth in the room and the parent. And we've had a fair amount of success getting parents to participate, not in all situations, but it's something that happens within 48 hours of um, a youth really demonstrating that, they, that they're either not going to or can't, um, can't stay with the program. Sharon, can you hear me? Yes, Peter. Yes, Peter, we can hear you. Okay, because my screen blanked out. I'm just going to keep going. Um, okay. The second slide, uh, we talk about the uh, stabilization program. It's something that, you know, part of our broader strategy was to open a, a program that, in response to youth that were being violent in the, and unresponsive in other programs, particularly staff, uh, youth that assaulted a staff member. It's a small program, 10 to 12 beds. It's not a punishment program. The youth that go to that program, they're assigned there. They're in programming all day long. They get up just, uh, if you walked onto that program, it would look like any, any secure program in our you know, service continuum. With the exception of the fact that we don't run groups, all of the clinical work and counseling is individualized. We don't run traditional classrooms. All of our um, school programming is um, individualized. It's a well-resourced, well-staffed program. And when youth are assigned there, essentially what happens is there's a treatment team meeting to determine um, what the goals are, what we're trying to accomplish while that youth is placed in that program, and then what's the exit strategy. And some of the, some of the uh, it's, it's a male program, so some of those boys will go back to where they came from. Some of them will be reassigned to other programs. Um, it's very individualized. We've had, we've had um, youth stay in that program up to six months, and we've had some pro, uh, youth exit that program within 30 days. And one of the real values of, you know, kind of system-wide, one of the values of that is that it separates the youth from the staff person that was assaulted, and it, it takes the edge off. A lot of times, the staff are trying to figure out, how am I going to be safe in this program if this young person that hurt me is still here? So having the stabilization unit available for that purpose um, is really uh, strategic in certain situations. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's a real thumbnail sketch of it. Um, the next slide is on the safety committee, and we have formed a safety committee and really put some energy in, energy and resource in, into the safety committee. It's comprised of senior managers, program level managers, our training and policy staff, human resource staff, some of the um, HR attorneys that actually sit outside of our agency, as well as leadership from three of our locals, our primary union locals. The focus is to address safety concerns through policy development, practice shifts, increased communication, and an open forum for problem solving. We review, we open every meeting with, with a data uh, review related to room confinement, restraint, injury, in industrial accidents, fights, youth on youth, assaults, youth on staff. Child, we, in Massachusetts, we call it a 51A uh, child abuse complaint. And we look at all of those indicators as the, 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 like the reality basis for the conversation so that we don't have a conversation that's really off the rails, not based on what's going on in the system. Um, the data is really critical because it, 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 really, it really forms the conversation 
and we have two deputy commissioners in the agency, and they co-chair this. One is on program services, field-based operations, and the other is on administrative and, and HR. Um, and the committee meets every six weeks, and we're getting a lot of traction on policy recommendations, um, simple um, purchases and changes that we can enhance safety in the program. And um, it's really taken the edge off of uh, some of the concerns about the acting out in, in, across the system. The next slide is on employee, employee support services. Um, we put together, we have a team of two in, in our central office that they do other things too, but they've been responsible for employee supports, we call employee support services. They're not in the HR unit, although they do talk to personnel investigations. They do, do direct outreach um, in the event that staff get hurt. We have an expectation that if a, if, a, if a youth assaults a staff member, that a senior manager on our staff will reach out to that uh, person and offer an opportunity to sit down. Um, we do mediation with youth. Sometimes, um, a, you know, a simple apology, a, you know, a, a genuine apology goes a long way. Sometimes the situation is more serious than that. Um, for committed youth, that we use the term time assignment. For committed youth that act all violently toward a staff, we'll review their time assignment, we review their placement, and decide whether or not um, we need to add time as a sanction and accountability for that behavior. Uh, that really gets some of the more sophisticated kids' attention. They understand when they when they think they're going to get out, and that. Um, Assault of behavior would have a really negative um, impact on their on their release date. Um, we routinely offer employee assistance services, which is um, counseling and support outside the agency that's available. Um, a key piece of this is that in the event that a staff member who is hurt decides that they want to file a criminal complaint, we stand behind them and support them, and have a manager go to court with them. Um, on their first court appearance as a you know kind of demonstrable um, level of visible level of support. We do not encourage staff to file charges, but in the event that they decide to go that route, we support them in that. Um, the other thing that we've done is we've done liaison work with the district attorneys that represent the counties where our primary facilities are. So the, in the event that a staff member does want to file charges, we have a facilitated process so they don't get lost in the, uh, you know, lost in the herd. Um, so I know I, I was going a little quick there, but I'm going to hand it back off to Sharon. Thank you, Peter, very much. So we do have some time um, for a questions and answer session, which I think um, may be a really critical part of this whole program. And so I'm going to ask uh, Brendan. I know folks have been sending in questions as the presenters have been uh, presenting. So he has a handful of questions. And I just encourage folks to continue uh, sending in questions. We're going to answer as many as we can in the time uh, that we have remaining. And so again, just chat, uh, you just have to type in the question into that chat box, and it will be routed to Brendan, who is fielding the question. So uh, Brendan, you want to go ahead? Yeah, thanks, Sharon. And remember to type in the questions here. If we have time, we'll make sure that we address them before the webinar end. And also, one of the most frequently asked questions I get is about the PowerPoint. So just a reminder that uh, we'll be sure to send a follow-up email. It's usually within 48 hours of the webinar end with the PowerPoint slides. Uh, so you'll get that email from us. Don't worry about that. Uh, so let's see if we can go back through uh, where we started here with Natalie and Mark in Indiana. Because uh, during your slides, you had mentioned the MAC Academy and, uh, in particular, some of the uh, components at the MAC Academy. One of those items on the list was your trauma-informed care. And any time that term gets put out there, we always get the question, what are you doing for your trauma-informed care curriculum? Um, is there something there over on the MAC unit? And make sure that you've uh, unmuted your phone line. We, um, our trauma-informed care is, uh, it was in collaboration with our mental health provider. Um, what it is, it's an all-day training. It uh, involves 
having staff be aware of the different types of diagnoses um, that our students may have. But more importantly, it spends an, a long time looking at how, without even knowing a student's trauma background, how you should approach a student, the do's and don'ts. So a lot of it was based on um, what our, our mental health providers had done and looking at some evidence-based materials uh, from SAMHSA, and, but modifying it for Indiana and the types of students that we see, kind of looking at our actual demographics and the types of mental health diagnoses that we get. Um, but the focus of that is much more as a line staff person, how can you create um, an environment when you're working on the unit um, with the student, uh, how to approach a student who is escalated, and a lot of different escalation skills and what not to do. So it, you know, we give some background, um, but we're not, you know, we emphasize that we're not asking staff to diagnose students or to treat students, but to be aware of that these behaviors might have a purpose behind them. That's really the main message of the, of the trauma-informed care training is that, that there's probably something going on with the student and to assume that and then to approach the student in a careful way. Um, so, you know, we've also been working on uh, adding to that training. We, we've recently gone through some training with uh, uh, mental health and juvenile justice collaboration training, and so we might be adding to that as well. But most of it originally came from SAMHSA and then modified um, through our uh, mental health providers. And the mental health providers are the ones that are conducting this training. Right. They go to the, the class and they teach it. So they're the ones actually conducting it. And there's a lot of tabletop discussion about throwing out scenarios. Um, how would you handle that, that uh, situation? What would approach? And then they also kind of be the devil, devil's advocate and say, well, how do you think you know that might, you know, a person might react to that situation. So giving them kind of those situations, troubleshooting some of those ideas and explaining how that could backfire on them, a typical reaction like if you want to walk in and really enclose on a kid, how that could that kid could react to that situation. So trying to troubleshoot some of those situations before they get into the situation with the youth so that they can kind of be aware. It's almost like a universal precaution, kind of like you treat everyone as though they have some traumatic experience and in your approach is more of that way. Does that answer the question, I hope? Uh, I think so. And in particular with trauma-informed care, you know, CJCA has done a handful of other webinars specific to trauma-informed care. So if uh, Heidi, who asked that question, or anybody else who's on today uh, wants to get some more information there, you can go view those past webinars on the CJCA YouTube page. Uh, but while I've got um, a question about curriculum, I think actually, Peter, you had mentioned individualized learning, and I got a question from Diane. I wanted to know uh, if there was a specific curriculum that you were using in the individualized learning. Peter, I think that was you. So um, what I was trying to say is that we, for the, I don't know if it was the individual support plan or the incentive-based approach. But the incentive-based approach, we actually have all of that written up. I'm not sure I'd, I'd qualify it as a curriculum, but it's a combination of you know, the positive incentives. And we also have a repair system that, that complements that from an accountability standpoint. As far as the individualized support planning process, we actually have a policy that's written, and it's prescriptive as to um, timelines and who participates and what we're trying to accomplish and all that, but we don't necessarily have a curriculum attached to that. Well, I know uh, anytime we mention any kind of forms, curriculums, policies, there's always the question, can you share that? So I'll make sure we uh, talk with each one of the panelists that were on here today and if there's anything that we can include in that follow-up email along with the copy of the PowerPoint, any forms or policies. Peter, I know a lot of policies are available on the Massachusetts DYS website. Uh, if there's anything else we can include, we'll be sure to do so. Certainly. All right, so let me see. Um, let me talk to Kirsten for a minute. And um, we had a question about, uh, you mentioned behavior specialists. Maybe you could describe the role of uh, the behavior specialist in OIA. And I actually remember from one of our past webinars hearing that OIA has a skill development coordinator. I wasn't sure if those are staff that are on the U unit as well. Maybe you could describe their roles. 
Yes, absolutely. And I think that um, that question might really be around the kind of program development specialist. I'm thinking. Um, but I can talk a little bit about both. The program development specialist is actually an individual that uh, also has um, a history and skills in as a clinician. And their role is really to kind of help support staff in exploring um, various interventions with youth. Um, it's really about supporting the ongoing program development since this is a new program. It's um, constantly changing and refining and improving and coming up with new and different um, strategies and how to work with these youth. Um, and these, these staff that are um, assigned to this unit um, certainly had to kind of retrain their brains as well and how to be thinking about interventions um, and interactions with these youth um, since certainly it is um, the entire feel of the program has a different look look and feel. So um, this individual also helped the mental health professional become proficient in the new curriculum. He was one of the developers of the Nexus curriculum. So he helped support that program. He's also coached Teaching um, staff on what we call structured staff engagement. So how do you engage and interact with youth at all times while also fulfilling the obligation of um, kind of the unit or milieu um, composition and, and, and kind of maintaining the safety and security of the unit. So being able to observe and watch other youth and what's happening uh, on the unit while they're also able to engage individually one-on-one. -on -one. Staff are also expected to participate in the curriculum, so this individual also helps support coaching staff and how they can engage and participate in that curriculum. They, this individual becomes a resource for youth, and this individual is the supervisor of the skill development coordinators, which you just um, brought up, Brandon, and he um, helps also incorporate the SDCs into the programming on the unit. We have two SDCs that are primarily assigned to this unit. They spend quite a bit of time out there. They're responsible for helping youth with skill development. They may take youth on a walk or take them kind of off units, especially if they are starting to feel as though they're going to escalate. As we, we spend a lot of time talking about flipping their lid, in other words, that the frontal lobe's kind of coming offline and I'm starting to live in my amygdala a little bit. How can that SDC um, work with that kid one-on-one -on -one to help support them and um, kind of bring that frontal lobe back online? Uh, but this individual also, or those individuals, SDCs, are also there to help support staff. So maybe they um, are uh, spending some one-on-one -on -one time with staff on how to work with a particular youth under maybe a, a specific circumstance or a youth that's escalating and how to come up with different, and as I mentioned, new innovative ideas um, on interventions and uh, healthy interactions. So hopefully that answers that question. And if there's any follow-up, please let me know. Yeah, great. Uh, I appreciate you expanding on those roles a bit, and uh, thanks for the explanation there. And I'm going to bounce back uh, to Indiana. We'll go back across the country here because I got a couple questions for Indiana and uh, some of the staff out there. I've got a question that is, what is the quality assurance for staff uh, in identifying fidelity to the MAC, tr uh, the MAC Academy? And you mentioned their training is an annual refresher training. Is there anything else in addition to that uh, that the staff are receiving there? Uh, do you tie their skills into their performance assessments, teaching new skills, et cetera? I think if I have the question right, um, one thing we do is so the, after the MAC Academy, um, we have a lot of, we have both CBTs as well as um, I guess face-to-face -face trainings each year for ref so it's more than a refresher. It's an, it's a week-long um, annual training that everyone does. We tie in um, some of the topics from Mac Academy go to CBT, and if so of course those are monitored um, by our training department. They have uh, uh, each one has tests that you must pass at a certain percentage. Um, I believe it's 80 percent, um, and so you have to pass all that. And then some topics that we deem uh, we don't want to leave to just a CBT. We then move those over to the annual training. And so, you know, we have a full, um, each, there's training departments at each facility. Though they're fully vetted. They, they are, uh, there's training audits every single year. Um, they're analyzing each staff member. 
you know, in addition to that, you know, we, we are adding, actually we just met about it today, we recently had some, uh, we received a grant with a, a mental health juvenile justice curriculum that, that does more, uh, does even more details into adolescent behavior and trauma. We've uh, just trained some staff to go, who got certified in that uh, training. We're going to start uh, implementing that at the different facilities in addition to the training they got. So we're, we're modifying it um, for our new employees. We're going into more details uh, from this uh, evidence-based training that we received for our veterans. We're doing some workshops with them to update them. So, you know, we're constantly monitoring that. Uh, each training department is audited by our, our central office training personnel. So we have checks and balances to make sure that, that training is being done with fidelity. And also, our new employees go through an on-the-job training process. So while they're doing that process, other staff are evaluating them to make sure that they're kind of complying with our mission and our expectations regarding these things about, you know, respect towards students and stuff like that. So if there is any concern, that would be referred back to um, their supervisor for their evaluation at that point. And all of our people that do the MAC Academy training have to be certified trainers for that academy. It can't, we just can't put somebody to go train that class just because we, we need someone to train it. And the last class that we talked about, the coaching, the scenario-based training, they get evaluated by the trainer at that point, and they have to, like Mark said, you know, get an 80% at least on passing those the scenarios in effective ways. And we also, you know, part of our our regular performance evaluation for all staff is is tied to how they're supposed to approach. So you know, it depends on the job description. So for our custody staff, it is going to have language in there in their performance expectations about how they work with students. Um, they're evaluated then by their direct supervisor, so for us, a sergeant on the unit. But also, you know, we, we take into account, you know, I was a grievance specialist, so we look at patterns of grievances on staff. That might be a sign that, that uh, we need to look at their evaluation and get them some more training. So that's, that's sometimes one of the things we recommend for staff that struggle or seem to have difficulties working with our youth, we will put them through more training. And so we, we utilize different systems to do that. Um, I find grievances to be quite powerful that way. Um, and so, yeah, we do look at that as part of their, and we have some, on our performance evaluation, we have general and specific. So in general, we have general topics that talk about just their approach with the students and then specifically for their job. All right, thanks guys, and I'm, I'm going to keep you guys up for just another second here. Another question that I had um, that I think was directed towards Indiana when you talk about your family involvement, and yes. uh, I know a lot of people struggle with getting families to be engaged, whether it might be uh, distance or all kinds of barriers that can come in with the family. So uh, how do you get families to participate in the meetings that you mentioned earlier? You know, What would you say your participation rate is, and how do you get them involved? I mean, I think the difficulty we have a lot of times is or we get the excuse that they can't travel to those because of our meetings occur during the day when most families are at work. So a lot of times we'll have to get, kind of get creative. Um, we do Skype at one facility. They are allowed to utilize that. Um, and then we'll also we do the phone calls. We do the conference calls like how we are doing right now. Um, those seem to be effective to include the families in those conversations. And also we, we have late nights. So those counselors, you know, work till 8 o'clock at night. So they can meet with those families and do that conversation. If, if they come in during visitation, you know, we're having a counselor show up at the visitation and like talking about the youth behavior and stuff like that during that time. So we try to utilize any opportunity we have to get that family in there. And we've talked a lot about our um, initiatives as far as, you know, family days and open houses. We just open our doors and allow those families, if they're going to come, we're, we're going to be abiding and we're going to make sure they're included because they are eventually these youth are going to go back typically to these families. So we need to be as inviting as possible and, and work with their schedules. I mean, we, we can't have those hours where we only allow you to come in during our business hours. Right, and for multidisciplinary team meetings, since that, you know, we usually have to schedule that at a specific day and time to, to get all staff to attend it. For families, what may end up happening is so if a family member is not available either by phone or in person, we, we, we have, um, a lot of times now we do have juvenile parole staff and we can utilize FaceTime. So a lot of times the juvenile parole staff will go out um, and be with the family so that they can call into the meeting. But, you know, if it's not convenient for their work schedule or, or with children, 
we will have, uh, you know, we ask that our counselor and our mental health staff and whoever custody are on the night shifts, they will go have a preliminary meeting with the family and discuss it and then report out an, at the multidisciplinary meeting. So it might just be two or three people in the room with the family, um, especially like right after a, an event that we, we might want to call the family and talk about an incident that just happened. But um, after that small meeting, then those staff will report out at the main meeting. So again, we try to we try to do it around the family if they can't make it to that weekly meeting. The, the weekly meeting, I mean, we have meetings going on all week long, which we did on the last webinar, our daily incident monitoring meetings. We immediately call families at night after incidents. The weekly meeting is more um, more global. So we're, we're looking at different patterns or if we, we're all getting together, um, we'll get the family's input. If it can't be at that exact hour, we've gotten their input somewhere else during the week. So it, we have to be pretty creative about it. But we do, you know, we don't want to show up to multidisciplinary meeting to staff a kid and not have, not have had a group of people who have talked to the family with their input. And real quickly, Mark, uh, just because I had the question, what's the lowest rank of line staff who routinely attend those weekly multidisciplinary team meetings? We can have, I mean, so, you know, it's exp now, so, so requirements are, are all of the department heads have to be there, but we also have all of the counseling staff. Some of our facilities, uh, they'll schedule it during lunch, so all of the teachers are there from our schools. And then if line staff, um, we've had some line staff from so, so a night shift volunteer to come in. We do work out that with them. So we've had as, as low as what would be our direct line custody officers come in um, and and meet during that meeting. So they're there. They can we could try to work it out where they can flex their time and come in. So but but required would be all department heads as well as all treatment staff, um, the mental health providers, and uh, where it's available education staff. Excellent. But for sure, because the custody supervisor, the officer in charge on whatever day it is, um, come there, the shift supervisor, and then if, if line staff are available and, and they want to contribute to the meeting, we make arrangements for them to come. Well, thanks, guys, and I'll, uh, I'll try and give you guys a little bit of a break here, and we'll switch back over to Peter in Massachusetts, because uh, speaking on the topic of families, the question that we got from Kent was, uh, in Massachusetts incentive system, can you describe the role of the parent or guardian or family members in your efforts to stabilize uh, frequently uh, deregulation youth? So as, as far as the family piece, I mean, that, that's another like broad program plan for us. And we're really, I mean, the, the individual support plan is a concrete place where we've made a commitment in policy that we're going to do what we can to get the family um, in the room, preferably, and if not in the room, on the phone to be able to have a candid conversation about what's going on with their um, their child. We, we, we've done an awful lot um, around that uh, as far as our family engagement and our family work, um, but that's, that's a small concrete piece. Could, I don't know if I answered the question, Brendan. Could, could you help me out there? Uh, so it, it was really just describing the role of the parent and guardian in regards to the incentive system, pretty briefly stated. Yeah, so we're, you know we're consulting um, family regularly on you know kind of what works, you know what 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 would be a helpful strategy. How do we engage um, their son or daughter? I mean, and I'm sure a lot of people that are on this call do the same thing, but. We've just become more intentional and more organized on that and found that for the most part, the families are a huge asset that we have really not historically tapped into. And, um, you know, most families, and all, you know, pretty much all families want good things for their child. They certainly don't want their child locked in their room. They don't want their child, you know, physically restrained. And to the extent that we have the uh, wherewithal to reach out to them, um, and, and it's beyond just the clinical. You know, one of the things that we're also trying to do on the family front is make sure that we capitalize on visits. Massachusetts is a lot smaller than Indiana or Oregon or a lot of the states on the call, um, and to the extent that we do have parents come into the programs to make sure that we're connecting the family visit with what's going on for better or for worse 
in the program with the youth. So we don't just let the parents show up for a routine visit and get in and out of the building without actually talking to them. Um, so we're using some of the small practical um, pieces that are available. Thanks, Peter. And um, Kirsten, I, hey, I have Brendan. a question your way in a little bit. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to jump back in. This is Mark from Indiana. Um, speaking of uh, families, one thing that we just changed as well is we had a reentry retreat. Uh, we brought in, uh, we were able to have a grant and bring in some experts. And they looked at our, at our intake facilities, like the family questionnaires that we do or were doing previously. Um, and one thing that we discovered is, you know, they were too long, they were too negative, and they were just check boxes. And so we recently revised our entire uh, way that we first work with the family. We have a new family questionnaire. It's only, it's, it's about four pages. It's, it's much more narrative, and it's much more uh, creating a conversation. And we really focus on strengths. And so we ask a lot about, you know, what's been the family's experience of the juvenile justice system? What goals do they hope for their child? What, you know, what, when your child is doing well, what's going on with your child? Um, how are you a part of, you know, what, what positive experiences do you have with your child? We also get a, their schedule now at the very beginning. So we ask them, you know, if we were to have, involve you in treatment, what are good times and good contact places for you? So we, you know, we do it right away and we make it very welcoming as possible. And it's done over the phone. We used to just mail something out with like a 14 page monster um, with just check boxes. And we found that it's helping out a lot. And then we did a training uh, pr or what we called a, a, a professional development with our counseling staff at the receiving facilities. They now, part of their job is to take that questionnaire and develop the case plan from there. And then when they, when they do the initial treatment teams with, if they can get the family on the phone or in person, they're to identify for example, hey, you know, when you got interviewed, talked to by intake, you had mentioned that this was one of the goals for your child. That is now a goal for your child. And so we're doing, trying to be much more strength-based and positive in engaging the families as partners from the very beginning. And we're finding that that's helping out when things may not be so positive. So if we're calling about an incident, we've already got a rapport that we're building. And we're trying to predict, like, what types of things do we want to engage the family about. So those of us you know, for example, for my, one of my jobs is to try to help the receiving facility staff predict what we are going to want to address with families. We even talk about aftercare in the new um, family question or asking them what services have you engaged in, how have you liked them, what hasn't worked for you, and what services could you, would you think might be helpful for your child. And that way we can start having our staff uh, get students prepared for that. So I just want to jump back in and add that. No, that's great. I mean, anything that we can do to help keep the families engaged and really get their input into the overall programs that the kids are receiving, uh, it's always beneficial. So I appreciate you jumping in and doing that. Uh, I haven't heard from Kirsten in a little bit, so let me see. I've got a question here actually about the uh, the staff retreat that you mentioned earlier and just at what point in the development were you doing the retreat? Was that during the policy development stage? Was that during the policy implementation stage? Uh, was it before or after the U? Uh, U of Life unit opened. Can you tell me a little bit about the retreat? You bet. We, um, we started that retreat um, following the development of the curriculum, but prior to the, kind of the official or formal launch of the, um, the U, kind of opening day. And part of that was because at the retreat, we had already identified several youth that were being referred to the program. And as a team, they were able to go through kind of a case review and determine you know, which youth were most appropriate um, to be on that unit. And I think that they started out with about five youth. And I think right now they have 11 youth with two mentors. And the mentors are kind of older youth that um, are uh, that really um, live on other living units that come and mentor on the U and then spend about a couple of months actually kind of living on that on that unit really to just provide um, peer support, peer mentoring, um, role modeling, so on and so forth. Um, but as far as the, the policy piece of it, there wasn't necessarily a ton of policy development that had to go into the development of the U because it was already within one of our existing um, facilities. And so really that policy piece um, was really already created. 
what it became more about was um, program development and part and as I indicated um, on one of my last slides around the new programs was that they spent a significant amount of time during that two weeks really defining and developing and refining their program which really ultimately created their identity. Um. Thanks, Kirsten. And uh, we've got a few minutes left here for question and answer. And I've got a good question here to, to throw past each one of our panelists here. And that's overall with the programs that you talked about here on today's webinar. Uh, what have you been seeing in terms of the outcomes? Are you seeing, uh, we, know, we know that ultimately we're trying to reduce time in isolation and reduce the isolation time. Are you seeing other reductions, maybe in incidents, uh, transfers in and out of the facilities? Can you talk about some of the positive youth outcomes that you've had, and um, I'll go ahead and uh, I'll actually start with Peter on this one. Can you tell us about uh, some of the outcomes in your programs? Uh, sure. It's 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 you know we're watching this very closely. Uh, it's a very mixed bag. Our incidents of room confinement have gone down. Uh, our duration in in the room has gone up. So fewer kids going in, kids going in and staying longer. We've had um, a trend down for the past 12 months in restraints, physical restraints, with the exception of one month we were bumped up, but a general trend down. Um, we've had fewer assaults on staff, more, assault, more fights in the last year or so um, between kids. Uh, so the dashboard's kind of all over the place as far as, you know, what this looks like. And I think that, you know, strategically for those of us on the phone, it, this is not all about room confinement. This is about running quality, quality programming and managing risk and trying to build the positives. I mean, we have a lot of really good academic um, outcomes. Um, our MCAS, which is the standardized testing in Massachusetts, our MCAS testing has gone up, um, so it, it's a it's like the dashboard is 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 very mixed. So it's not like we could sit here and say we won the war, um, but we we the data is really key to being able to um, have a handle on where you are as you make these decisions. And uh, you know what was we're, we're actually running real close to the end of the session here, so. I'm going to take that as the last question, but there were a lot of questions that we didn't have time to get to. So we'll make sure we'll have a record of everybody's questions, and we'll try and follow up with uh, everyone again individually as best we can. I know a lot of people were asking for the PowerPoint. We know that we'll share that with you. If there are copies of any policies or the forms that we talked about with today's panelists, we'll be sure that we can get copies of anything that can be shared with the group here. So thank you all for all of your questions. And uh, Sharon, why don't you go ahead and take us home here? Okay, great. Thank you, Brendan. So in closing, I just want to take another moment to thank um, all of our presenters again today, um, as well as our participants, um, particularly our presenters. Um, you know, I know that folks, as I mentioned before, folks are really busy, and so uh, I know this is a big chunk of your time to do this, and we really do appreciate the valuable information and, you know, helping provide guidance um, in terms of, you know, reducing isolation and obviously um, using effective strategies to deal with these tougher populations. So we really do appreciate it. And so before we end today's session, though, I do have a couple of quick announcements. I want to make sure that I get this out there. So we recently received notice that OJJDP uh, will be funding a in, um, in youth facilities technical and training assistance program. And so we are going to be sending out an RFP probably mid to late December uh, to those states and counties who may be interested in applying for this free technical assistance program. And so over the past two years, I think I mentioned before, is that we've um, had a total of 14 jurisdictions participate in this TA program. 11 of those jurisdictions were actually state agencies and the remaining three were county jurisdictions. And so this opportunity is really open to anyone and everyone um, who, who wishes to apply for it. Um, so we've already received a lot of positive feedback from the jurisdictions who have participated to date. And so I really would like to encourage states and counties everywhere really to take advantage of the uni uh, this unique opportunity. And so you can do that um, if you want to be included on the list of folks who are contacted, uh, the, basically the distribution list for the RFP. 
you can go ahead and contact me, that's Sharon Pett, and you can see my email right there on the screen. Um, go ahead and, and I'll make sure that you, you, know, you, know, you get on that contact list. Um, again, just a reminder that the TA is free to the participating jurisdictions and we are going to be able to serve up to, I believe, six jurisdictions for the third and final cohort. Um, and, and we're also going to be posting this information, obviously, on the CJCA website, um, both the announcement and the application, so you can also continue to look there. Um, and so lastly, as we said, um, you will be getting the, the recording of this webinar as well as a PowerPoint presentation in the days to follow. And I really do, we all hope that you know, got something out of this, you felt like this webinar was valuable and helpful in the work that you do. And I just want to thank everyone for participating and great questions and uh, encourage everyone to keep up the great work. So thank you, everyone, and I hope everyone has a great day.